Problem solving is at the core of programming. So by learning to solve problems, you can become a great programmer. So let's look at the process I use to solve programming problems when I get stuck. Before you can solve a problem, you need to understand what exactly you're trying to do. So before you start writing code, take the time to completely define the problem. The human brain is great at making things seem simpler than they really are, so this step will help you think of any issues you might run into later. This is also a great time to find a rubber duck, which means you should go find a person, a pet, or even an inanimate object to explain your problem to. Explaining a problem out loud can really help solidify your understanding of it. Let's use a mechanic from a game I made as an example. I wanted the level to change as the player moved, so I needed to control collisions for the two versions of the level. Specifically, I only wanted the player to collide with obstacles that are part of the level that the player is currently in. In the end, I accomplished this by changing the shape of the collision boxes on the obstacles as the level changes. It's a pretty complex problem, so in the next step, we want to make it easier to solve. You should always look for ways to break complicated problems into smaller, simpler pieces. Usually, smaller problems are easier to solve, so the more you can break it apart, the better. This makes it easier to write clean code, too but that also comes from experience. You want to keep breaking down the problem until you have parts that are easy for you to implement. In some scenarios, it may be easier to start with a specific part, but if you treat each part as a separate problem, you can usually start with any you want. Once you pick a part to work on, go back to the first step and define exactly what you want it to do. Let's think of a few parts we can break our example problem into. The overall problem we're trying to solve is changing the shape of a collision box based on the state of a level. I can already see two parts from that explanation. So we need to determine the state of the level, and we need to modify the collision boxes. Both of those are still fairly big problems to solve, so we could break them down even more. Some of the smallest parts could be things like determine if a vertex of the collision box is in the wrong version of the level and needs to move, and determine which direction the vertex needs to move and by how much. Both of these pieces could be implemented in a few lines of code, so they should be simple enough. If the parts are closely related, you can sometimes solve them together if the combination is still a small enough problem. Now, you want to think of an example for the part you're working on. This should be the simplest example you can think of. It doesn't even need to cover every possible situation. We just want something that we can start working through. Let's think about moving vertices in our example. We'll say that we already know whether or not a vertex is in the right part of the level, but we need to move it if it's in the wrong part. Let's consider a collider that's just a horizontal line, so it only has two vertices. One of them's going to be in the correct part of the level, and the other's going to be in the wrong part, so we'll need to move it. Now we want point A to move along the edge of the collider until it reaches the split in the level, so we need to determine which way it needs to move and how far it needs to move. If we know where the level is split, we can say that we want the move distance to be the distance from point A to the split. And since our collider is a horizontal line, we can just subtract the position of A from the position of the split in the level. The sign of this subtraction also tells us which way the vertex needs to move. So we can just move the position of the vertex by the result of the subtraction, and we have our solution. Now we want to walk through that same example again, except this time we'll write very simple pseudocode for each step in the process. At this early stage, I keep the pseudocode really simple and try to avoid anything like loops. For our example, we take the position of the level split and subtract the position of the vertex we want to move. Then we add that result to the position of the vertex. If your pseudocode is more complicated than just the few lines that we have, then you should probably go through and revise it. This is where you can add things like loops and make it look more like actual code. If you do change your pseudocode around, I recommend walking through it with your example to make sure you didn't make any changes that don't work. Now you can finally start writing some code. This is where you'll want to turn your pseudocode into the first iteration of code. You may want to think a bit about how this part's going to interact with all of the other parts, but don't worry too much about it yet. Just write the code in a way that you can test it independently from the rest of the problem. Once you finish your first iteration, you should try running through it with your example, and make sure it works. If it doesn't work, there's a few ways you can solve any issues, and how you do it depends on how big the problem is. If it's something like forgetting a variable, then you can just add that into the code, but for bigger issues you may want to revisit your pseudocode to fix it, or in some cases you might have to break the problem down even further.
If you just can't get it to work for your example at all, you may need to go back and try to think of a different approach. But if you find yourself in this situation, you probably didn't simplify the problem enough to start with. If you got your first example working, then it's time to try and break your code. Try to come up with as many weird examples as you can that might cause problems. The more tests you run now, the less likely you are to find bugs in the future. Look at the places you expect to see problems. You'll usually find them where the code is most complicated. Now treat each example just like you did for the first to slowly work out any bugs. I oversimplified the example we used so that I could point out some obvious problems. For example, if we were to move the vertex B up a little bit, then we don't have a horizontal line anymore. Now our simple subtraction won't work, and we need to come up with a new solution altogether. So at this point, I would take this new example and go back to write pseudocode again to solve the new problem. If you have to completely change your approach like this, you should revisit your first example to make sure it still works with your new solution. After you've gone through several iterations, your code is probably going to be a mess, so this is where you want to revise and refactor. Simplify as much as you can, remove any unused variables, and make sure that if you ever come back to this code in the future, you know exactly what it does. You can also start thinking more about how all of the pieces are going to fit together. Look at the inputs and outputs of each part and get ready to connect them. You're going to want to repeat all the previous steps for each of the parts in your original problem, but once they're all working as standalone components, you can start testing pieces together. Connect the parts one at a time and run through some tests to make sure there aren't any problems. You should go through all of the same troubleshooting steps you used for the individual parts, but you also want to make sure the problems aren't caused by how the parts are connected. Once all of the parts are connected into a single system, then it's time to go back and revise and refactor again. This time you want to look for any large pieces of codes that need to be broken up and clear up any dependencies. If you are careful about making all of the pieces, then your code should be close to following the solid design principles. I recommend making sure it does at this step because it makes it a lot easier to add functionality and debug in the future. The last step to this should be easy. Once you have a good, clean, working code, don't touch it again unless something breaks. If you want to add any functionality, you should add it as a completely separate piece that doesn't require you to make any changes to the existing parts. It's a pretty repetitive process, but by following it, you should be able to solve any problem, with some help from Google, of course. So be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.